This is a production of Cornell University. And we'll start with the yesterday was the dead and it was such a, a big hit, Carl, that I just couldn't resist having two days in a row of bonus content. And since we're talking baseball today with Evan Machete, I think we should say goodbye to Hoy Field, uh, one of the oldest uh, same location yeah. baseball fields in the NCAA uh, established in 1922. And I believe the last game uh, has in fact been played on this Carl. Uh, and I think the first game this weekend is being played on the new uh, booth field complex that's moved uh, off campus a little bit. And Evan, take a good look. Cause we're going to talk about synthetic fields uh, as well. Cause okay. I want to see you go down the rabbit hole on uh -oh. getting these surfaces uh, to behave uh, in a particular way. Carl, so we're good to go. I can move right into it. We'll do the we'll do the way we've been doing it. I'll get going and then pass to you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So uh, everybody, welcome to the show. This is a sports edition. The Yanks are winning. The Red Sox are losing. It's a good day. The universe is aligned. And, and while we make our way through the fastest 30 minutes, it's it's good to just remind everybody, you know, Everybody should be a Yankee fan, Evan. <laughs> I thought I'd start out with a couple of goofy first picture gifts, right? Who can resist? I don't even know who did this, but this is hysterical. You throw it and hit the guy in the camera right in the soft spot, right? But this is the best one, the dog first pitch. The bulldog running in from uh, home plate with the ball on his back works every time, Vel Velcroed on his back. So, we're in for a fun chat here about baseball today, but as we're talking about growing grass, even though it isn't the primary focus many times of baseball fields, it's been warm. Everybody knew it was above normal, as much as 20 degrees above normal last week, and it looks like it's going to be a quick return to normal. So it's probably going to feel colder as average temperatures, particularly in the upstate New York area, are going to go back into the 40s and at night maybe into the 30s. So we're still going to be a few degrees above normal, but nowhere near uh, what we were. Now, looking across the region, we're about 10 to 21 days using growing degree days. And the way heat accumulates since March 15th is the value we use. We're about 10 to 21 days ahead of normal. I don't feel that. I think this is one of those places where degree days might be a little bit off. I like soil temperature better, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, speaking of soils, they're dry. You know, last week, everybody was less than a quarter inch through the region. Uh, we got some rain coming. Almost everybody's going to get some rain through the weekend. There certainly was a patch of wet weather in, in northwestern New Jersey, uh, but not a lot of people we talked to have actually seen that. But there's much as a, a three, four inch dump that happened there where most of the rest of the region was less than a quarter of an inch. So it should be about an, uh, an inch coming through, at least upstate New York. Uh, and the metro region uh, on Sunday. Sunday should be a washout, which could be a big loss with a lot of people using fields uh, on the weekend. Now, this is something worth noting. And also when you're taking care of dirt, no matter where it is, you know, the overall pattern is we've been dry for almost a month now. And there's a big, strong gradient out in Buffalo, Rochester, pretty wet. You come through the central region and all the way down to the Southeast where it gets really dry. In fact, the new drought map is up uh, yesterday, so I included it here, and you're starting to see some real uh, dryness, moderate drought starting to occur all the way from, you know, Maryland and Delaware, West Virginia, maybe probably in Northern Virginia, all the way up to Rhode Island, uh, up the I-95 corridor. Uh, pretty, pretty accumulated dry weather, which is good, you know, if you're getting out and it's dry, it's good, but if you're managing these fields, Having to irrigate fields to keep them growing to get the traffic tolerance uh, isn't always something that's easy to do. Now, when you look at soil temperatures, they're really starting to warm up. Everybody's really in the 50s. I mean, if you're watching us here, you can see we got some blue colors, but even the blues, there's only a few places where it's still in the 30s. But those are the highest elevations and along some of the lakefront areas for sure. Now, uh, soil temperature is going to drive weeds. Weeds on sport fields are quite a problem. Lesser celandine is the one that everybody's talking about right now. This is a perennial that comes and goes. If it is a perennial problem for you, 
There are options for controlling it, but literally after it flowers and it sort of vegetates, you can't see it anymore. So if it's a chronic problem, you have to wonder about uh, other things you're doing in your management program that might be uh, leaving this, especially on a sports field, leaving a void. Now, flat weeds, the winter annuals uh, and perenni early perennials are flowering, and that's starting to happen now uh, across the region. So everybody across the region should be seeing something in flower uh, right now if it's growing in the lawn and it's able to flower at a low mowing height. We're just starting to touch into where the ester formulation of 2,4-D works really well on broad leaves in the spring up the Hudson Valley and in the Metro New York, New Jersey area, Philly, Harrisburg, stuff like that. So you're starting to get into that zone. So that means the dandelion's probably getting blooming now. So these sorts of recommendations actually look uh, pretty consistent with uh, where we're seeing. We're seeing almost no maybe one or two dandelions beginning to bloom here in upstate central New York. Crabgrass, just maybe early germinants, uh, you know, along buildings where things are really hot. Bare areas tend to get some germination. Again, with the wear and tear fields take, particularly in the fall, that was pretty dry, uh, uh, that the winter fixed a little bit. Uh, we went in pretty dry. Um, having thin turf, poor turf, Getting going in the spring, you're probably going to get crabgrass and not weed germinating before you get any turf grasses germinating. So if you want to get out there and get ryegrass going, I would definitely encourage you to start doing that. You've got those fields being used. Uh, all, by all means, start to get into that repetitive overseeding. Soils are warm enough that ryegrass will get going. And you know, remember the old saying, I think it was, it was a USGA agronomist, uh, God rest his soul, Stan Zontek used to say, ryegrass is better than no grass. Now, a lot of times people have these kinds of fields during the season and they got crabgrass all over the place, right? And so you got bare areas. If you don't have broad leaves, you might have crabgrass. And so you have options now at seeding, right? In the past, it used to be just 2%. And so now if you have the ability to use herbicides and you've got to do some seeding, you can incorporate tenacity in there. And mesotrione will also give you a little annual bluegrass. We'll give you some post-emergent crabgrass control. So there's a lot of options here in sports fields where you want to overseed and also manage the weed control, Sp particularly if you're behind the eight ball already this spring, right? If you're coming out in the fall, you're coming out of the fall thin and you're starting to spring thin, you know, it was a mild winter. Maybe kids were out there even playing through the winter, depending on where you were in the Northeast. There wasn't enough snow to keep them off. And not everybody, you know, can get those kids trained on sneakers like uh, Ben Palmer can, right? So you might have some wear and tear. You might need some herbicides. I'd start with the overseeding and then go to the herbicides. And here is the man of the hour. I found out a geologist who actually wanted to wound up being a sports field guy. And now turning out back to geology uh, along the way. Evan, welcome. Before we talk about the dirt, we're going to have Carl talk. But before we have Carl talk a little bit about his spiel. He's got a great one coming. For me, uh, I want to talk about uh, what you did here. I think, if, was this your master's? I don't know when you did this work. This was advising sod producers on how to manage sod in the field so that when you thick cut it and put it down, it had maximum traction. Yeah, maximum, I maximum divot resistance. Maximum resistance, right? Which means, you know, you're, you're, you're getting better traction, right? You're resisting a divot. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I thought was cool here and, you know, we, we, folks can read this in this old sports they're old now, right? We're old men yeah, now. This is a couple of years ago. Right. And, and the interesting thing was low nitrogen, low nitrogen production areas that actually weren't that green had better divot resistance than higher and better looking grass. Can you talk for a second about how you did this and what you found? Sure, you're correct. This was my master's project. We worked with a sod farm to look at some of their management practices. And, you know, at the high level where these NFL or high level college fields are resodded all the time, the field manager doesn't have much time to really adjust the condition of the turf uh, because you're sodding and then playing on it only a few days later. So there's really no time for the sod to root or cutting it pretty thick, you know, an inch and three quarters, to two inches of, of root zone, so to speak. 
And so it has to be stable right away. And so the management factors that go on at the sod farm is really what governs how the field will perform once it gets to the stadium. And one of the, obviously the most basic cultural practices that we use in turf management is fertilizer. And this is especially true when you're in an establishment scenario like sod. So the production timeline for this kind of sod is usually around 14 months. It would be seeded like in August or you know, late summer, early fall of kind of year one. And then it'd be harvested around Thanksgiving of year two. And so we were looking at, you know, once the turf is established and you've gotten it to grow in, what can we do to, to maximize the root growth and the amount of rhizomes that the sod is, you know, best knitted? And we found that there's this sort of trade-off between visual, visual quality, so to speak, on top and the, the performance of the, the, the root zone, the stabilization by those roots and rhizomes. And it really it comes down to just what, what the grass plant is trying to do. You know, when you fertilize, obviously it's going to take advantage of that nutrient because nitrogen is pretty scarce in nature. And it's going to grab on and try to produce as much vertical top growth as possible. And that the consequence of that is it uses up all the sugars that, that can be produced through photosynthesis. And instead, as, as football field managers, we'd rather those sugars go into storage in the crowns or, or even better into roots and rhizomes. And so that was kind of what we found was that by sacrificing a little bit of color, you know, you can make up for this with dye and pigments and other things, but you could actually get the field to play better. Okay. Well done, Evan. Thanks for that. And for all of you, that's the end of the grass conversation for today because it's infield dirt day. And just in case anybody didn't know this, if you work, I grabbed this off of one of your presentations, Evan. Thanks for making this slide. I got to put the credit thing at the bottom here. The labor intensity uh, in a baseball field, you look at how little uh, the dirt area makes up in a field, uh, maybe 15% but it takes 80%, 90% of the resources to tend to it. So I asked chat GPT, Carl, what wow. makes the best How about infield this? mix, right? I asked for, I asked the, the, the machine, what makes the best mix? Mm -hmm. And it says, depends on climate and soil in the area, the amount of sand, silt, and clay. It can vary, Carl, which I know you're going to get right into now. And it's also important about the maintenance. So you know, I'd encourage someone to just type in what's the best mix for baseball infields. The machine's pretty good here, Carl. So the pressure's on, bro brother. What do you got? What do you got for us today? Yeah, so it, it's great to see that slide, the infield stuff, Frank. And I'm going to get to that the the sort of effort and and the precision that you put into getting excellence. And, and we're going to talk about really sort of highly managed infields today, MLB level, uh, high level NCAA, and. And I got to thinking, you know, excellence, when people think of that at that highest level, they think of the effort you put in uh, on the turf side. It's the timing of products. We talked all day yesterday with Rich about timing applications for, for root diseases. It's uh, the product selection. It's the deployment of labor. Uh, and, and so I got to thinking of John Rahm, just won the Masters, right? He's one of the best players in, in all of golf. And obviously execution is a big part of that. Uh, but what all these great players do and, and what great uh, operations do is they build in this margin of error for themselves. Uh, so that they can seed in this, they can succeed in this wider sort of array of situations. Uh, and when you look at someone like John Rahm, a golfer, and you look at his swing, uh, we'll, we'll look at his swing here, and everybody get a golf lesson real quick. Uh, you can see things in his swing that build in margin for error. So uh, I've got three pictures for those uh, who who aren't watching. There's a, a picture of him pre-impact, at impact, and post-impact. Uh, and the things that that golf instructor instructors will remark on is. His club face stays very uh, sort of square to the target. It's not rotating a bunch through impact. Uh, he's not using his hands, his little muscles to really sort of square it up with timing. He's using a lot of body rotation, his bigger muscles uh, to clear through and control that club face. And what that does is it builds in margin for error, right? He doesn't have to rely on that timing that can vary shot to shot, those smaller muscles. He's using bigger muscles. That's what allows him to hit a lot of good shots and then to do it under pressure like, you know, 18th hole at Augusta. So uh, he builds in this margin for error in his golf swing. And then when you start to look at, at maybe some sports metaphors, uh, right back when we were able to shift, uh, the idea behind analytics and shifts was that, hey, you know, instead of relying on a shortstop who's got to cover a lot of ground over there, if, if the ball gets hit in that direction, hey, if we know a player's going to hit it over that side of the infield a lot of the time, why don't we just put three people over there instead of two? And that lowers our need to execute at this really high level and it builds in that margin for error. So that's the idea behind analytics. And then you start getting into turf management and these things that we do that increase margin of error. So things like removing trees around putting greens, right? That gives us more light, it gives us more air. 
that's going to produce better grass in a larger array of environments. Uh, soil specifications, right? USGA pine and green specifications, that helps us control moisture even when we're getting a lot of it. We're, we're not getting a whole lot right now up here, but when you do, that gives you more margin for error. You can still produce good greens when you get a whole lot of rain. Same thing with athletic field drainage, right? Better in, in more situations. This is where we transition into your work, Evan, uh, with, with infield mixes, right? And trying to figure out, hey, what's that range I can keep of, of soil moisture in the infield dirt that gives me the you call it cleat in, cleat out, sort of the, the nice uh, performance of that infield. And you've got a really cool graphic over there, right? You know, historically, we've got this really small range. If we're too dry, I've got a picture up here of the, the sort of the clotting. I think you call it the clumping that happens when you get too dry. You get these chunks all over the baseball then when it's when it's taken a hop, may go a weird direction and you know hit someone's chin or you know cause an error or something. So you got to keep it uh, dry, wet enough to avoid that. And then also if you get too wet, right, you get the slippage and sort of the instability that you don't like. So uh, we can get to this final slide here and I don't want to explain too much of it, Evan, and this is where I'll bring you in. But, uh, you know, I talked about USGA specifications and really what you're looking at now is specifying these infield mixes using sort of traditional geology, these engineering concepts. And what you're saying is, hey, you know, we might have 20% uh, clay in a mix but it actually matters what kind of clay you have to get those sort of soil moisture, ideal soil moisture bands. Again, for the people who aren't watching, there's these three different clay types that are present in the same percentages when, when you're testing them in the lab, but certain ones have larger sort of moisture ranges. So this is where I bring you in, Evan, sort of what, what led you to start investigating this uh, and how have you applied those sort of geo, geology principles uh, into this uh, you know, specification? Uh, business you're in now. You, I'll just say you guys have remarkable comprehension. Uh, you've cherry picked all the best slides, and and I'm very impressed at your ability to to reiterate the important concepts here. So I got interested in this topic while I was working. After I did that sod project, I left and worked at various professional uh, baseball stadiums around the country, mostly on the eastern half of the United States. But I just found it really interesting that um, depending on where you go, the soil would perform really differently, even when this, the particle size analysis would come out very similar. You could have that, like Chat GPT recommended, you could pretty much follow their recommendations, but you might not get the same result. And uh, so people have tried this with different kinds of clays, and we picked these three because they're, um, they're sort of the most common families of clay minerals. There are different sort of subspecies, so to speak. Uh, within minerals, just like there is within the, the kingdom of life. But these are the sort of most common minerals that are found in nature, depending on the uh, the climate and the parent material that are rocks, basically, that are allowed to form the different clays. And they have different structures, and, and we don't have to get into the, the nitty gritty of that. But essentially, what, what makes a, the biggest difference is the affinity of the clay surface for water, right? So smectite, in particular, it's a two to one clay. It has a lot more surface area and it has a lot of charge. So there's a lot of negative charge associated with the surfaces. And th those surfaces are, they're hungry for water. They want to be satisfied. And as a result, they can actually grab onto or retain a lot more water and maintain their stiffness compared to something like a, like a one to one clay, like a kaolinite, which is a lot more broken down, doesn't have quite as much surface area and uh, is shaped a little bit differently. And so, you know, this is a this graph or this this series of charts is a little bit, it's a little bit difficult to interpret not having the background of the whole experiment. But essentially, the length of the bar would represent the acceptable range of water content where you could actually play on in that infield. Yeah, and I, I got this one right. Yeah, is yeah. Here's another same one. Same thing. Yeah, this is right, another version thing. of the same thing that has them has them across it, and it's just the 60, 20, 20, right? And Carl's point: the margin of error is the wider the bar. It means the it'll perform in that wide range of moisture content. Is that is that that's what this is saying? That's right. And, and that's it has right. to do with properties of clay that you've begun to identify. Okay, I, look, listen, we've been on a few times. We this is, I think the third time we've. I think it might be the third. Yeah, time. I think the third time. One time we talked about that scientist that created that little vessel that you tested something. We're not going down mm -hmm. that rabbit hole, but <laughs> but you know, for people to understand now. If they're managing clays that to get to Carl's wonderful point about the margin for error, right? Um, there are different clays that get used in these systems. And you noticed it early on when you were working. It's like, wait a minute, it's the same 60, 20, 20, but it behaves totally differently. You've identified these things. Can a guy go out 
Evan and just buy this stuff and say, listen, I want a 60-20-20 kaolinite sesquioxide mixed clay. It, can I do that now? No, unfortunately not. We're not quite to that level. Maybe in, maybe in the future that will be possible. Um, for one thing, companies that that are you know mining and excavating and blending these materials, so, some of them are aware of this, but a lot of them aren't. That you know, to them, you know, it's red dirt and brown dirt. They're not really aware of the clay mineralogy. Um, and secondly, it's you know it's geographically dependent. So no, uh, unfortunately, we're not quite to that that phase yet. Okay, so listen, one of the things you talked about, I want to expand the conversation and get you to speculate a little bit in the last 10 minutes, things you might actually not know, but probably know more than you think you do uh, until somebody asks you the question. So here's the question. We got a lot of crappy weather up here uh, in, in upstate New York. And, you know, Cornell's been playing baseball literally since February. Right. Um, a lot of people, particularly without snow this year, you know, it was cold uh, and dry, which might not be bad. But you've talked a lot about how these things, these clays behave with the moisture. Can you speculate a little bit on how these clays behave under cooler and wider ranges of temperatures? Uh, I don't I don't think the mineralogy plays such a role so much as as the way the water is able to flow through the surface. So, I mean, the higher <clears throat> certainly the the higher swelling clays they're going to be more affected by freezing and thawing because they have more water associated with them over the winter time mm -hmm. so that you know that could be more of a concern where you get more heaving um but as far as like the temperature itself once the once the soil is thawed out i don't think really would interact necessarily with the mineralogy so the mineralogy but what about working it oh Oh, definitely. I mean, the workability, there, there's almost like when this. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back for a second. You did say something. Swelling clays. Which one of these is a swelling clay? That's smectite on the bottom. That's an expansive clay. So depending on the, the type of cations that are in there, whether it's sodium or calcium, um, this is more of an issue out west. where you, In the east, eastern half of the United States where precipitation exceeds ET, you're more likely to find a calcium smectite, which is less expansive, but will still undergo a lot, quite a bit of shrinking and swelling, and okay, that will so, crack as it dries okay. out. Okay, so let me go back to the slide that we that Carl put up here, because um, the smec this is seems odd to me. The smectite performed better over a wider range, so did, well, all the clays performed better over a wider range when there was less of it in the mix. Yeah, this is a little bit, it's a little bit goofy. <clears throat> um, and one thing that's not captured here, so like the left end of the bar, this represents that cleat in, cleat out water content. And yeah. once you get above, when, when you get to these higher sand contents, although they can still perform and give you that, that cleat in, cleat out performance, it's never going to act the same as a mix with like 60 or 55% sand. So as you approach the point where the sand grains start to stack against one another and bridge and form that rigid skeleton, um, you give up some of that playability. And so although it is easier to manage, uh, from a water standpoint, you, if you were to put professional athletes on these sandier mixes, you'd have a very difficult time maintaining that. Um, I don't want to leave clays completely, but this, other than temperature, let's get back to working clays when the temperatures are cooler and mm -hmm. assuming not covered, which is the majority of youth and up, you know, the high school baseball fields. Let's get yeah. Yeah, let's get a one on one on this. Like, give, give me a one on one on this. So number one is if the, if you're out if you're trying to walk or drive equipment on the field and it's rutting or it's making footprints, you need, the only thing that you can do is stay off until it dries out enough. It's so tempting, no matter how skilled you are or how long you've been doing this. Everybody wants to get out there and do something because we all feel like we need to be doing something, right? So the number one thing is is to wait. And the reason is you're going to destroy whatever stability is already there. And, and by walking or driving in that field, you're actually creating positive water pressure in the pores. And that the, you know, that, that pressure is basically going to blow the, the, the soil apart. And it's going to make it even harder to get back into shape. So that's number one. Uh, hopefully so number one, you, hold on. Let me reiterate. Number one, if you get any kind of surfaces smearing, as you described here, the technical term of smearing, right? Uh, right. Um, you're not only injuring that surface for that moment, but that potentially has lasting impacts on your ability to recover it. 
It does. If you have any conditioner on the surface, you're very liable to, to bury that because you're incorporating it, you know, probably too deeply yeah. into the skin. Yeah. You're going to create large footprints or ruts that are going to be difficult to repair. So absolutely not just for today, but for the future, you know, stay off that field until you can get out there without rutting it. Okay. Um, conditioner you brought up. Should I put conditioner on in the fall? Uh, or should I make sure there's nothing? I mean, generally the conditioner goes on and comes off. You don't really want to leave conditioner on there, do you? Right. Yeah, I, I would always take the conditioner off in the fall if you have the ability to do that. Um, you can sweep it. You can get it into a pile with a backpack blower. Mm -hmm. If you want to leave it there, you know, to save yourself a step, I mean, that's okay. But I like to take it off because it um, it blows into the turf, right? So over the, over the winter time, we're worried about not just water erosion, but also the wind erosion. And uh, that can create some issues with lit buildup, especially along the back arc. And, so typically, and, you know, you take ahead. this conditioner, strip the conditioner in the fall and then reapply in the spring. And you don't want to incorporate the conditioner into the infield mix, correct? No, that's correct. There's an older, you know, in, in older days, <clears throat> the mentality was to actually put this material in and till it in, you know, yeah. as a soil, a soil conditioner, so to speak. I know. But we've kind of gotten away from that philosophy, um, although those materials will absorb more water. And that's not to say they're not going to help you get out there after a rain event. You're really you're losing a lot of the benefit because you want that material right at the surface to do the absorption. If it, you know that, those conditioner particles are two or three inches down, they're not really helping you that much. And they're going to reduce the stability and make it more of a sandbox you know, consistency. Well, so your and best bang for your buck is keeping it at the surface. That's right. And, and the conditioner has the, you know, during the season has the benefit of actually holding moisture uh, in, in the clay. Uh, not, it, not itself being moist, but sort of covering the infield clay so it can't lose as much, right? It acts like a little bit of a buffer. Um, there's kind of, there's different viewpoints on that. And there's, there's two different, you know, there's the main different kinds of conditioner. There's the vitrified or uh, expanded shale type versus the calcine clay. The calcine clay ha does have a pretty high affinity for water. And so in some cases, it can actually steal the moisture from the underlying infill mix. But in general, if that conditioner is kept moist, it acts kind of like a mulch or like a blanket to insulate from the sun. Okay, folks, we have officially gone down the rabbit hole. If you thought smectite was the beginning of the rabbit hole, we, we are there now, Evan. So I got to not damage it. First, so it's first do no harm. What's the next thing to get these fields going in the spring when it's cooler than maybe you'd like? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the next thing is to get a good roll in that field because no matter what clay type you have, you're going to have some, at least in these, this northern climate, you're going to have some freezing and thawing associated with the wintertime uh, cold temperatures. So getting, <clears throat> uh, ideally, you can get a one or a three ton roller or something you can rent, you know, dual drum, smooth drum that you can get a nice roll to get that frost heave out. If you don't have access to something like that, you can tire roll or you can use a roller that just, you know, fills with water and the drum that you can tow behind. But that's that's kind of the next step. And then if you've got any any small leveling to do, I mean, this would be a good time to do that also. Uh, it's generally t doing a full till and <clears throat> laser grade in the springtime is challenging because there's oftentimes some wet spots and it's difficult to get everything repacked. But that's the reality that the, oftentimes we have to do that. That's when contractors can fit us in. Right. And uh, so if there's any major leveling that needs to be done, obviously we didn't really talk much about that, but the yeah. best way to prevent, you know, rain outs is having that positive surface grade and avoiding right. bird baths. Yeah. All right. Listen, I don't want to get the synthetic. I want you to tell me about the key test for those of, uh, uh, I didn't put it on here. Evan has a website with uh, much of his work, including a link to a, the recording we did last year. Um, and Evan, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the key test. I'm not going to show the video of you developing this tool to demonstrate the cleat in, cleat out, and the plotting. Uh, I'd refer people to the website for that. And also this really cool tool uh, app you built where you can move uh, the various bars along and determine water content. Uh, this is a really cool little thing, uh, Evan. Well done. But let's start Thank with uh, the key test. Uh, what is the key test that you so you called it canonical? Yes, <laughs> this is one of the first things you learn when you're taking care of the infield to judge, you know, subjectively <clears throat> how is the moisture, how is the uniformity of the moisture as a function of depth, and uh, you know, do we need to be adding water on, onto the surface? So you can, this is after a game. You can see on the left side there's actually a little bit of a you know a bulge or, or a shove, and then some mm -hmm. clay marks. 
And this played really well because you can actually get that key. You know, everybody's everybody that works in facility management has these big brass do not duplicates. You can jam one of these into the ground without too much resistance, and it becomes just something you learn by feel. You know how much force does it take to get this key in there, and then does it come out cleanly? And so ideally, this key would come out without any soil being removed, without anything sticking. It's almost like baking, you know, cupcakes where you put the toothpick in and yeah. see if yeah. But done. that that wasn't good enough for you. That wasn't good enough for you. No, so that's, you know, that, that test is a little bit subjective and it doesn't really give us any data points about how much water is actually in there. So we built this machine at Penn State with the help of the engineering services shop to actually replicate athletes running around in these soil samples. And this prevents us from having to use human subjects. We can do this in the lab uh, where I'm located right now. And we can just build these soil samples that are about the size of a coffee can, roughly. And then we control the moisture and then we actually test them to figure out what is that critical water content where the soil will begin to chunk out as opposed to giving us that clean and clean out performance. The engineering guys must love you. So what about this little gadget? What about this little tool of moving the different particle size things? Um, so, this, this looks like it's going to have application uh, in the future if we can have access to these kinds of mixes, right? I think so. I mean, this is something I just built kind of for fun. Um, but <clears throat> if you're a soil supplier and your goal is to produce you know, a, a, a infill mixture with 60% sand, but you are doing this by mixing a sandy soil and a clayey soil. Well, in nature, there's no such thing usually as pure sand or pure clay. So it's not just a matter of adding, well, six parts of the sand and four parts of the clay. You have to account for the fact that the sandy soil has some fines in it and the clay soil has some sand in it. Usually even clay soils will have between, you know, five and, and 30 or even 40 percent sand if it's a like yeah. a loamy texture yeah you, so you only have to have 20 percent clay to have clay in the name using the that's right if you triangle. look at that textural triangle the the clay bearing soils they dominate most of that and doesn't take very much clay to affect the behavior of the soil and that's kind of what that triangle is getting at right. so this is just a, it's a simple you know toy calculator if you had no if you know the particle size analysis of the fine grain soil or the clay soil and also the sandy soil, this will give you the ratio in order to achieve that final mixture of 60 or 70% sand. Everybody's going to remember when you were on this goofy show with us, when you become the next Norm Hummel, this you're plowing absolutely new ground here, Evan, in an new area ground. that's yeah, good, good good really soil pun. That's right, a little soil pun there. Okay, listen, before I let you go, uh, wh what are your thoughts about these synthetic surfaces, right? Most people, I actually think, Carl, we don't have a clay mound. I think the new field yeah. has a synthetic mound, okay? Synthetic. So not a whole damn thing synthetic. What do you think, and this is, I think, a very practical matter in where we play baseball in the wintertime up here. Um, did, do you have any insights into how these surfaces behave? Are they really favorable because they're pretty uniform? And do you know anything about the rubber and the way that stuff behaves? Or did you just stay down the dirt hole? So in my PhD, I haven't gone down this, this particular hole, but we did, we've done some studies in the past at the Center for Sports Surface Research here with my advisor, Andy McNitt, and uh, Tom Sorensen is the manager of our research program. We've done some studies on different, uh, different blends of infill. Oftentimes these have uh, a mixture of sand and rubber, or now they're going to more like organic cork or um, coconut coir type infill materials. So I don't have a ton of personal experience with it, but the companies that manufacture these products have gotten pretty good. And the playability is much better than it used to be to the point where the bounces are much more uniform. Um, it used to be that players really would complain about the, the elasticity of the rubber. Mm -hmm. And I think depending on the system that those concerns have been alleviated somewhat, the, the mound and the plate are a real concern as are the lead off areas. And mm -hmm. like most synthetic turf, um, or all synthetic turf, obviously these are, they're not no maintenance, you know, certainly right. there's going to be less dragging, less, obviously there's no mowing. So the maintenance is less, but um, you really need to pay attention to these high traffic areas. Mm -hmm. And periodically the mound, the home plate, and even those, like I said, the lead off areas, those have to get lifted and replaced. And um, they can be pretty, pretty routinely, pretty, yeah, pretty routine. routinely, like pretty often, and that can be expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's something to be aware of, you know, if you're thinking of installing a field like this, you do obviously you can get out there sooner in the springtime, there's going to be some unforeseen headaches associated yeah. with those high traffic well, areas. Yeah. And you got to literally go out, you know, especially at first base, you got to go out every, after every game, just like they go out and fix in the clay after a game, you got to yeah. go out and sprinkle a little rubber 
and move that around because the more you leave those fibers exposed, uh, your advisor, Andy McNitt, has taught us, uh, the quicker they break down, the more they abrade and the life expectancy of the field uh, declines. So it's almost like those areas need to be peeled out. I think they've got them with Velcro or glue or something that they can yep. be peeled out. All right, listen, yep. Carl, it wasn't the fastest 30 minutes. It was 34 minutes with bonus content. Evan, thank you uh, for taking the time uh, to join us. Uh, My what pleasure. A joy. Carl, I, are there any pressing questions uh, or no. we want to get out of here? I, I think we're just downloading our material science uh, half an hour for the day. It's it's really cool to hear the specification stuff. And like you're saying, Frank, maybe, hey, we're going to have these uh, more refined specifications for infields. I'm, I'm thinking about putting greens and the angles of sands, right, the angularity and stuff. So uh, it's really cool to, to, you know, another pun, get in the dirt and, and <laughs> talk about some of those details. So. Thanks a bunch, Evan Machetti. Uh, we've got his uh, website down there and all the links. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can, you can go check out that website. Thanks, everybody, for joining episode uh, 10 of The Church Show this year. Uh, we'll see you next uh, next week. Thanks, Take Carl. Care. Thanks, Evan. Good to see you. Thanks, guys. Thanks Thanks time. Time. Well done. So this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.